All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining in with our uh, EdTech Showcase for NC3 ADL. Uh, this afternoon, we have Rachel from Active Class as well as Josh. Uh, they're going to present to us about uh, social media. Is it the worst uh, or is it? Um, so, Rachel, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Rachel Meisner. I'm the Director of Education and Engagement in Active Class. And today our um, session is titled Social Media is the Worst, or is it? So to get started, um, I'd like to get to know some of you. So please introduce yourself in the chat. What's your role? Um, if you teach, what subject? Do you teach asynchronous, hybrid, or synchronous courses? Um, I'd love to just see um, everyone and where they are. All right. For some reason, it's not letting me see the chat, but I know Josh from Active Class is monitoring the chat for us. I'm going to stop sharing my screen momentarily so I can see the chat. Adjunct instructors, primarily online. Faculty, 100% online. Hi, Amy. Hey. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Microbiology and general bio. Thanks, Becky, to fully online courses. All right, as we introduce ourselves, I'm going to introduce myself again. My name is Rachel Meisner, the Director of Education and Engagement at Active Class, but um, I'm also an educator by trade. So I spent almost a decade in K through 12. I started as a library assistant and then became alternatively licensed and became a library technology educator. Um, and for the past four years, I've also been an online instructor for the Colorado Community College System. I teach history, primarily survey courses. And I also was previously an OER coordinator and grant writer, as well as a course designer for Pikes Peak Community College, which is now Pikes Peak State College in Colorado. I joined active class earlier this year um, and left Pikes Peak State College just because I loved what they had to offer in classes and hoped that I can implement them as an instructor as well. So I'm so happy you're all here. I don't know if I'm going to take your entire time today, your entire hour, but we can go ahead and get going. So today's agenda is um, pretty straightforward. So for the first 15 to 20 minutes, just going to do an overview and share some data of how students currently learn, some dropout statistics, and give a brief intro of active class. And then um, the next 30 minutes, I'm going to hop into our active class demo. This is in Canvas, um, but whether you use Moodle, Blackboard, D2L, wherever you are, we plug right in and it looks about the same. I teach in D2L and we fully integrate. So just keep that in mind. It's just that our demo environment right now is um, set up in Canvas. And then the last 10 minutes, we'll have a Q&A discussion and feedback form. I have a quick Google form that's completely optional if you'd like to fill it out. And of course, if you have questions at any time, please feel free to type them into the chat and Josh can answer them or he can stop me and ask the question and then I can answer it for the group as well. So let's get started with some current statistics. And these were updated June of this year. So according to the Education Data Initiative, first time undergraduate freshmen have a 12 month dropout rate of 24.1%. So almost a quarter of our freshmen are dropping out in their first year of college. Among students who are first time bachelor's degree seekers, Almost 26% of them ultimately drop out of college, and among all undergrads, up to 40% drop out. 
And 39 million Americans were college dropouts in July 2020. So right as COVID really started hitting, but only 944,000 of them re-enrolled that fall. So less than 1 39th <laughs> of our students who dropped out in 2020 have re-enrolled. Pretty shocking statistics. I've noticed it as an instructor. If you've noticed it as an instructor, um, you can type that in the chat. I My enrollment was up to 40 students in a class in this semester. I have some classes with that much, but some I only have 12 students in. So big statistics there. Next, we're going to go over student dropout demographics. So post-secondary students from household with the lowest quarter, um, the lowest quarter income, are almost 80% more likely to drop out than students from higher income households. Most college dropouts are between the ages of 35 and 64. This one shocked me a little bit because I thought it would be a lot of those first year younger students, um, but our older non-traditional students are dropping out um, and are the majority of current dropouts. First generation bachelor's degree seekers have a dropout rate that is almost a quarter percent higher than average. And first generation students have a 92.2% higher dropout rate than students whose parents have degrees or a higher level of education. Our American Indian and Alaskan Native students have a 45% dropout rate, which is the highest among all of our ethno-racial demographics. Black students are almost 34% more likely to drop out than the average college student. And students with disabilities are almost 60% more likely to drop out than students without disabilities. This was shocking to me. Um, I know in my courses, I've been aiming to be more um, accessible and more engaging for students with all learning styles, for students with cognitive disabilities and physical disabilities. But the fact that uh, students with disabilities are almost 60% more likely to drop out really showcases that we need to do more in terms of accessibility and scaffolding for all of our students. So what does this mean for the institution? I know as instructors, we think of our students and we want them to succeed, and we think of the courses that we teach, but for the institution that's around nationally, of course, not each institution, but that's $16.5 billion annually that's lost in tuition. So when we think of the rise of adjuncts. I'm an adjunct myself, right? Um, rather than full-time faculty. Um, and the rise of cutting courses and cutting certain sections in colleges. This is what colleges look at when it comes to making those big um, fiduciary decisions. So from that survey, um, they amalgamated the dropout reasons and almost 40% are financial aid and debt. But the other chunk is, is a multitude of reasons. So 13% is social fit, 9% is support, 3% is mental health, 5% illness. I'm sure mental health and illness have gone up significantly since COVID started. 4% is distance, and then 28% is academic disqualification. And mostly uh, academic disqualification could be for a variety of reasons, but most of my students who experience academic disqualification are on probation because they failed classes in the past. So we kind of combined all those reasons and almost 40% of that is again, financial aid, financial issues and debt, but we would like to call the other 62% inconsistent engagement experiences. Because if I go back, if I look at social fits, support, mental health, even academic DQ, a lot of that falls within social fit and engagement. So what does engagement mean? We created a word cloud here. So involvement, participation, our biggest response that we got was community, self-direction, playfulness, optimism, connection shared experiences, persistence, and interest. So there's a lot of ways that students and instructors define engagement, but I really want to focus on today is our community, our shared experiences, um, and participation, and also connection. Connection is so important in online classes, 
I've had students in my online classes that say, Rachel, you're the first instructor that's actually answered my email within 24 hours. <laughs> I haven't had this experience in any other course. I actually feel like I'm a member of this online asynchronous course. So we're going to talk about um, the way that active class can help incorporate community and build that connection in your course. So how many hours do students currently spend on social media each day? The answer is three, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, Twitch, Facebook, Snapchat, YouTube, Twitter, Discord. On average, our students, not only our 21st century learners, but all of our students are spending an average of three hours on social media a day. I can attest that I spend that much time on social media each day um, just because, oh, I'm sorry, it stopped presenting. Let me stop sharing and I can represent that. Um, I can say that I spend that much time on social media each day. And right now, while I'm resetting up, um, why don't you share which social media types you use in the chat? If any, I can say personally, since I can't see the chat, maybe Josh, you can contribute a little bit here because it won't let me click on the chat while I'm presenting. But I personally use Facebook, Reddit, TikTok, Instagram every day. Are we getting um, getting many responses, Josh? Yeah, we have uh, YouTube, Discord, Twitter, LinkedIn, TikTok. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, um, WhatsApp. We've we've got the gamut. <laughs> oh, wow, that's awesome. And I do have to say, I was just at the Open Ed Conference. I'm on their board there. And we use Discord for all of our communications. And it surprised me how many people participated in the conference that already were familiar with Discord. So um, when we consider how students use social media and how many hours they're in social media each day, we need to think of if our classes mirror that. I mean, I wish as an instructor, my students would spend, you know, a couple hours in my course each day, just as they do on social media. So what we're trying to do at active classes, we're trying to make that connection and make learning more intuitive to students, but also make the learning environment more relatable to students. So among our current schools that are using us, SNU, University of Arizona, Delgado, Harvard, Denison, um, Michigan, Columbia, we went in and did analytics. And on average, students are spending two hours in active class each day. So their behavior is starting to mirror the same behavior that they're exhibiting on social media. So active class is working because it feels familiar. It looks like social media. We live in your LMS. So your learning management system. If you're in Canvas, D2L, Blackboard, Moodle, Genzibar, uh, whatever, so, whatever LMS you use, we stay in your LMS and students do not have to leave your classroom to access us. We work for both synchronous and asynchronous learning styles. And we're DEI forward. So I'm going to show you some of our diversity, equity, and inclusion um, tools that we use to try to make every student in our courses or your courses feel included. So who are we? What do we do? What are, are we, right? So Active Class is an LMS agnostic plugin. As I said, we're currently in every um, major learning management system. We even got into Genzibar in a South Dakota school. We are flexible for any learning environment that you have. We, as I mentioned, students do not have to leave your learning management system when using Active Class, so there's no external app. It looks like they're in Canvas or Moodle or Blackboard, and there's no um, differentiation there. We bring a social media-like learning environment to your courses. And as an instructor, I absolutely love this. We can replace your announcements and discussion threads. So I post announcements to my students every week in D2L. Hey, everyone, here's your walkthrough video for your rough draft assignment. 
here's how to write a thesis. And then I get 20 emails that say, Rachel, I don't know how to write a thesis. What's expected in the rough draft? And I'm like, read my announcements. But I have no way of tracking whether students are actually ingesting my announcements or not. So um, I'm going to show you some really great tools that we have to help increase that student engagement. And then some of the DEI features we have include anonymous posting, anonymous grading, we have a name pronunciation tool, and pronoun identification. And I'll show you that when we do our demo. And this is how current instructors that we've talked to are currently using Active Class. So as I mentioned, we have announcements and discussion board replacement. They use it for asynchronous, hybrid, and synchronous instruction, even if their synchronous instruction is in person. They're using it to humanize the classroom. And when I say humanize your classroom, your students are not a number. They're, they're people with names. They're sharing their ideas. They're sharing resources. They feel like they're part of a real community inside your classroom. We're also used for authentic assessment, which is assessment that is related to the student's everyday life and personal interests. And we engage students in various ways and allow them to show up as their authentic selves. So outside of graded discussions, um, we also have an un, mostly ungraded, we call it our water cooler learning environment, where students can share personal information, they can share links, and I'll show you all of that in just a minute. And then we provide collaborative learning opportunities for students as well. Engaging in communities of learning. This is something that I've recently started using as an instructor and I absolutely love it. And then again, sharing resources. So now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen momentarily. Um, if Again, if you have any questions, thoughts, anything like that while I transition to our demo, you can type them in the chat. We'll also have a 10 minute discussion period at the end of our presentation and we can discuss there. So I'm gonna go ahead and reshare my screen. All right, so I'm in Canvas right now. Again, we are in any LMS that you have. So keep that in mind, but this is what the Canvas course cards look like. And we live inside your course. So I'm gonna click on our demo course here. And active class shows up in your course ribbon. So as you can see, I've hidden quite a bit from students. And if I go to the student view, they only have a few options here. So my landing page is my course syllabus, and then active class is threaded for students. So I'm going to leave student view. And once you click on active class, our landing page is called active feed. This is the one that I mentioned that's kind of our water cooler, mostly ungraded learning environment. And as I scroll through here, you're going to see it looks a lot like social media. So if students or the instructor share any videos, all you have to do is copy and paste the link and they go directly, they auto embed directly. So for accessibility purposes, you don't have any of that link language. This one, the student left the link language in, but it's still embedded, so it's still accessible. So it looks a lot like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, um, most social media platforms. So students have a few options when they log into ActiveFeed. They can type, and this is where they can post anonymously. This is only peer-to-peer, -peer, not student to instructor. So if I'm the instructor and I see an anonymous post in my class, I can scroll over that anonymous name, and I know that was Jacob Rasmussen. So if I have a student who's posting something that's inappropriate or something that should not be in the course, then you could always see um, who's posting in your class. Students also have the ability to report posts. So if you miss something and they report it, that will go to you, and then you can address that as well. It's always nice to have our academic um, behavior, our integrity policies in our back pocket for students. Students also have the ability to attach or record. So they can attach any file. We don't have a file size limit or a type um, restriction. And they can also record themselves auditorily or through video. So all they have to do is click, enter a recording title, and click use recording. And that actually auto captions. So in our physics course here, 
our, our um, CEO, Nate, did a recording of himself yesterday. I'll play that real quick and you'll see how it auto captioned. Hey class, here's a quick announcement. <laughs> So it auto um, captioned for him immediately, just minutes after, and um, that helps our accessibility departments as well and our students who are hearing impaired. So they can record themselves again auditorily or through video. As a history instructor, I've been trying to get students to do more authentic engagement. So instead of having them just write a research paper, I ask them to do first person historical narratives where they act as someone from history. And this is a great option where you can have themselves record themselves, share it and give each other feedback before their final submission. As the instructor, you have additional tools. So our delay tool is what I like to say can eliminate your announcements for it. So at the beginning of the semester, I create scheduled posts. So like upcoming this week, I will post this or I want this to post on Monday. So I can delay that and have that post Monday at 8 a.m. And then as soon as I click post on that, it becomes a scheduled post. So you can see for this course, I've already scheduled some posts, so I have due this week, due tonight, upcoming this week, and I linked the assignment. So if students click on that link, it automatically takes them to the assignment. And other posts. Oh, and I also have a walkthrough for my students. I created a video walkthrough of their annotated bibliography, and then that will auto-release at 8 a.m., and um, I've also pinned these to the top of the course. So as you can see, they're pinned now. If you want it to not be at the top of the course when um, it posts, you can unpin it. But if you click pin, it will post to the top of the course as soon as that announcement releases. And you can pin as much or as little as you'd like to the top of the course. So if this webinar is super important, I can pin it. And that's the first thing now students see. And then when I'm done, I can unpin it and it falls back into the thread. Another tool that we have for instructors is our conferencing tool. So you can use this in multiple ways. One is for live lectures. So if I'm doing a lecture that's synchronous and required and graded, all I need to do is type in the lecture, date, time. You can type instructions here and click on your conferencing app. We can embed Teams, Google Hangouts, whichever conferencing app you use, we can create a button for. We use Zoom here, so I'm gonna click Zoom. And if it's required and you have an attendance grade for it, you can even grade attendance. So once you assign that point value, as long as students are logged in for 80% of the time that the instructor is presenting, that grade automatically goes to your learning management system gradebook. So if students attend this and hit 80%, they automatically get 10 points in the Canvas gradebook. If they don't attend, it will assign zeros accordingly. I'm an asynchronous instructor, so I use this a lot for webinars. For instance, thesis writing, a lot of students don't know the difference between a summative and an argumentative thesis. So I'll do date time. I'll do a little post that says, hey, everyone, we have a webinar coming up. It's completely optional. Then all you have to do is click post. And now it's at the top of the class. So when students log in, they will see join Zoom meeting and all the instructor has to do is click start. If you have auto record and auto captions already set in your institutional Zoom license, because all we do is connect this to your institutional license, it will auto record and auto caption for you. So as the instructor, I just click start. Again, we stay in your LMS, but we have full functionality. So students can still ask questions. Um, and when I'm done, it actually will auto post to the class if I recorded it. So this is a Zoom webinar that I did on choosing a research topic. And as soon as it was done and rendered, it automatically posts to the course. So then students can like, comment, and engage with it asynchronously. The last tool we have for instructors is polling. So all you have to do is ask your poll question and you have as many answer choices as you'd like. This is completely anonymous and should not be used for grading. And the reason that it's anonymous is because we 
um, we want students to be honest, right? If I'm an instructor and I'm like, how's the course going? But all the students know that I can see who they are. Most likely more of them are gonna be telling me that the course is going perfectly fine, even if they're struggling. So this is a great temperature checker. And I have an example here of one that I asked my students. So every semester, what is your experience with taking courses online? I ask this because I started teaching before COVID hit and most of my asynchronous online students um, had taken online courses before. So I could just get in and be like, all right, everyone, let's choose research topics, let's go. Then COVID hit and I had a bunch of traditional students just dumped into my online courses and I would start teaching and they were like, Rachel, I don't even know where to find the syllabus or the course content. Like, I don't know how to use D2L. So then I had to shift my perspective as an instructor to being a more skills-based instructor. So now I, I define myself as a skills-based instructor through the lens of history. And I use these polls as temperature takers throughout the semester. So for instance, um, one of our units or modules is the Cold War, which is the back half of the 20th century. And I'll ask students, you know, how do you feel about this particular concept? I got it, I need more information. I don't know what you're talking about, lady, you're crazy. And then I can, um, change my instruction or adjust my instruction based on student needs. I also ask them about course materials. Like, do you prefer text, video, audio, um, music? What kind of resources would you prefer for me to share with you in this course? And then I get a better idea of student learning styles as well. So there's a lot of good use cases for anonymous polling. Another um, thing, another element that we use in active feed is hashtags. So in this course, I used hashtag intro. So if you search a hashtag, everything with that hashtag will come up. So here's everyone's intro post. Someone obviously likes tears for fears. And yeah, so you can scroll by hashtag there. Um, my students as a history instructor, hate using Chicago style citations. If anyone out there is familiar with them, um, I know that uh, footnote bibliography is not everyone's favorite and we're the only um, or subject that uses it. So for my students, I decided to get a little cheeky and we do Chicago sucks in my class, not the city, the citation style. And we share resources using Chicago sucks. So I created a webinar for students. My maiden name is Weldon. Um, one student shared a YouTube video on embedding in Word. Another student shared a citation generator. So the students can um, search certain hashtags or just keywords, and everything with that keyword or hashtag will come up in the thread. So um, if I'm if it's our Vietnam War time and I just search Vietnam, you'll see um, Jacob here shared a TikTok of weapons of the Vietnam War. And then I also, one of my specialties is the Vietnam War. So my post pops up as well because there is that keyword in there. So this is a great time saver for instructors. Um, instead of students constantly emailing me saying, hey, Rachel, I saw that you said my footnotes weren't formatted properly. How do I do that? And instead of me sending individual links or posting announcements that students may or may not consume with links, you can just post it in active feed and it's searchable by student or for students. Students can also filter by user. So if they only want to see instructor posts, they can click on the instructor and all of the instructor posts pop up. They can also search by student. So if there's someone in their learning community or someone that uh, said, hey, I posted this, then they can filter that by student as well. So we make it pretty intuitive for students to be able to navigate active feed. Um, as you can see here, um, we've shared files on how to write thesis statements. Um, I created a meme for my students. So in all my classes, I create a course playlist um, let me see where my course playlist is here. I created a meme because someone added the Backstreet Boys, so we just became friends because I was super excited about that. So you can make this as informal as you like or as formal as you like. So I do a mixture, and this is how I really focus on humanizing my classroom, right? I want students to share resources that they find, whether they're on YouTube or Instagram or TikTok or 
something that they've created themselves. I want students to be able to talk to each other about themselves openly. So I do a hashtag just for fun where um, this last semester I had a student who participated in student government and she did you know, hashtag SGA for Student Government Association, and she would post everything that's happening on campus so students could participate, like scary movie night and all that good stuff. So again, this is our water cooler, mostly ungraded learning environment. I'm going to take a moment and move over to active assignments in our physics course and show you what that looks like. So to create an active assignment in your LMS, I'm going to show you how to do this in Canvas, but it's the same in all learning management systems. So instead of creating a discussion assignment, you would click on just normal assignment creation. You could click assignment, name it, type your prompt here. I know um, I had an instructor ask if they could do multiple prompts with different links and videos. You can do that just like you could in your normal learning management system. You can insert links, videos, pictures, documents, anything. And then it would be the same as setting up your discussion. So if it's a 15 point discussion, I'm gonna put this in my assignments. And all you have to do instead of doing your online text entry, which is what most of our discussions are set up as, is do external tool, click find, click active class, select, and as soon as you save and publish that, it becomes an active assignment. So there's no extra lift for you. If you work off of the course copy model, we call them shells in the Colorado system, but a course template or course copy model, if you have that original course template and create all of this in your course template, it will copy over into additional sections. So there's no additional work that needs to be done. I'm going to go ahead and pop into our space flight discussion here in physics and show you what we do in discussion boards that's different than your learning management system. So if you go to edit details, once you create your assignment, your initial post date was created when you created the assignment, but we allow you to create an additional due date for comments. So for students, they'll see the due date for their initial post and their comments due date. Um, this helps eliminate those students who post everything at 11.50 p.m. on Sunday night when it's due, their initial post and responses to peers, which eliminates that substantive interaction. So this just helps students stay on track with when they should be posting. You can also toggle on and off late submissions. So if I turn late submissions off, students can't post after that initial post due date. If you turn it on and they post after that initial post due date, when you grade, it will say it was late. You can turn on and off anonymous posts and comments. Um, you can allow editing and deleting posts. I like allowing my students to edit posts because a lot of the times they need to fix citations or arguments that they're posing. And then we're also a Turnitin partner. So if you use Turnitin, we can get your originality score for everything to make sure your students are not copying and pasting from Wikipedia. We also have the option to recommend or require a word count. So if you recommend a word count, students can post under that word count. It will just alert you, and I'll show you what that looks like when you're grading, to say that they were under the word count. If you require the word count as they're typing, it will say one out of 50, two out of 50, and they cannot submit that initial post until they hit that word count. And that's the same with comments. And I love requiring a comment word count because it eliminates a lot of that same, I agree, good job posts that aren't substantive and we're trying to get students to be more substantive in their replies and for their interactions to be more meaningful. You can also dictate the minimum number of comments as well. So from the instructor perspective, this is what it looks like. How many points is it worth? Have you graded it? Are grades published? When are initial posts due? When are comments posts due? And are you allowing late submissions? For students, it will tell them the amount of points that are available, if they have a grade, when initial posts are due, when comments are due, and then right here it will say um, posts and comments and it will track. So if you have three initial posts required, it will say zero out of three. And as soon as they post one, it'll say one out of three and it will track that for them. So I like to, um, I like to encourage instructors to have students use this as a checklist. It's almost a simplified rubric that's right in front of the students. As you can see, 
our discussion boards are not a discussion board is what we like to call it, um, looks a lot like social media as well. You can still leverage hashtags here. You can still do keyword searches. So if I search flight, everything with flight will pop up or space. This is a space flight discussion. So I would imagine that those would come up pretty often. You can still filter by students or instructor. Students can still attach and record. Um, they can post anonymously if you turn that on. Um, a use case I had for that was last spring, I had a student who suffered from severe social anxiety and I worked with our accommodations department and I didn't have active class in my course at the time. And her accommodation was just to email me all of her initial posts, all of her responses to peers and all of her assignments. So she did not have to interact in the course at all throughout the semester, which kind of eliminates the purpose of building an online community. So that anonymous feature can be used for students with social anxiety and you as the instructor can still see everything that they're posting. Again, they can attach and record. When they when I ask them to record, um, something new that I've gotten into pedagogically is I ask my students every discussion to have one initial post and two responses to peers, but one of those three posts has to be video or audio. So I turn off that word count requirement. I make it recommended um, for my discussions just because I like students to record. They can make videos and audio for all three, but a minimum of one post needs to be video or audio, and they still have to have a full bibliography and citations as well. When it comes to grading in here, all the instructor has to do is click submissions, and you can see all of your students and their level of completion. So um, I know every semester we have maybe our favorites and our not so favorites in classes, even though we don't like to admit it. <laughs> But um, to avoid implicit bias, we give you the option to hide student names and grade anonymously. So Cerulean Manatee is at the top here. This changes in every thread that you create. So Cerulean Manatee may be, may be Green Cheetah in the next thread. So this truly randomizes your students so you can't even have bias against the color and the animal in your class. When you go to grade and hide student name mode, I am going to go to Lime Moose here. It covers up or it hides all student names. So I can see this is Lime Moose's initial post one, and then Peach Sheep and Cerulean Manatee um, commented on their post. For the sake of showing grades, I'm going to show student names here, and we're going to hop into Rayana. And when you grade, all you have to do is click on that little magnifying glass and initial post one is here. That's Rayana. I can tell it's her because her name's on the side here. Post two, Rayana. And then I can see all of her comments plus the initial post that she commented on for context. So whatever learning management system you use, sometimes it shows it, sometimes it doesn't. In D2L, I only see the student post and then their responses. I can't see who they responded to. So sometimes I'm like, what are you talking about? So this allows you to see everything in the same screen. And you can click through their post and comments, scroll here. You could see our word count was recommended, not required. So it will tell me that they didn't hit all the word counts. If you are a Turnitin partner, then it will show their originality score here, and you can provide feedback right here. So great job. And you can attach feedback. So when my students do rough drafts for a, a research paper or their annotated bibliographies, I'll download it in Word or put it into Google Docs, write comments. I tell them that I tear them up um, and I can attach that. You can also record yourself auditorily or through video giving feedback. And as soon as you click send, that hits your grade book. So there's no extra lift for you. And you can grade by going through individual students this way. Or what I like to do is go through all of their posts and comments, everything substantive, scroll through every student, take a quick look. Everything looks good content wise. So I can click autofill grades and it will assign grades based off of due date and word count. Again, it's up to the instructor to ensure everything's substantive and um, autofill in zeros as well. So once those grades are autofilled, they go straight to your grade book. And then if you need to make individual adjustments like, and Leo, he met the word count, but he typed, 
I agree in a really long way. I'm going to drop that down. You can do that right here and it automatically goes to your grade book. So the feed book and grades automatically go there. A couple um, diversity, equity, and inclusion features that we have outside of um, anonymous posting and commenting, hiding student names and grading, live in your student profile and your profile. So if you click on yourself here, you can identify your pronouns. I know some LMSs do this, and if they do, we just ingest that from them. But if it doesn't, you can identify your pronouns. And you can also use Say My Name. So if you click Say My Name, you can record yourself saying your name. And whether you're in active feed or active assignments, if you have a little play pronunciation button here, I love this one. Nate, our CEO's daughter, did his. So I'll play that. Nate Hurst then you can hear how everyone's names are pronounced. And I have a bit of a story about this. So in my courses right now, there's, um, I'm not, I don't have active class and I had a student message me and they were like, Hey, Rachel, I need help writing my thesis. And I was like, cool, that's what I do. I love helping you write theses. And they gave me their phone number and I called them and their name was spelled D-A-N-N-I-E-L-L. -L. So I thought the name was Danielle. So I called and a man answered and I was like, hey, can I speak to Danielle? And he was like, uh, my name's Daniel. I'm your student. And then I had to spend multiple minutes apologizing to him. And he's, you know, he was gracious about it and said, it's OK. It happens all the time. But um, it, it helps eliminate some of that confusion with students. It also helps, again, humanize your classroom, build more of that online community and help students more easily engage with each other. We also have the online now feature so students can always see who's online. And by the end of the year, we should have a direct messaging feature and it will look a lot like LinkedIn messaging where your messages will pop up here um, and students can individually message each other or individually message the instructor. I know I mentioned communities of learning earlier and I wanted to go over that just momentarily before we take a break for um, questions and the form fill out. But um, when you use active class in your course, and I teach in modules, I just wanted to show everyone what this looks like. So when I go through modules, all of my modules show up here and all of my content shows up here. So here's my lectures. This is an active assignment, but it just looks like a discussion. So when students click on this, it opens directly into active class. So there's a seamless movement in between active assignments and um, file submission assignments. For instance, my annotated bibliography assignment is a file submission assignment. So that's not used in active assignments, but it looks the exact same to students. So when they go to upload it, all they do is see the instructions. So they look um, similar or basically exactly the same. So to students, it doesn't look any different and we live in modules. For learning communities, I like to separate my students by topics in my class. So based off of the topics that they choose to focus on for the semester, I'll assign them to a learning community and they join the community. They're visible to everyone in the class. And what I do is I ask students to share their annotated bibliographies, thesis statements, project outlines, rough drafts, and give each other feedback. This is an ungraded section in my course, but I use it at the end of the semester if students are like sitting on the edge to bump up student grades or to improve their participation grade. This is a great way to engage students and have them share resources and chat with each other and address issues that they may be encountering in the class within their topic. Um, some students also will post that with an active feed, which is great, but this just gives them another area where they can collaborate and get to know each other more on an individual basis. So overall, um, that's kind of our, our high level demo of active class. I'm going to um, go back to my presentation here. So I'm gonna momentarily stop sharing my screen and get back in and we're gonna put up questions and thoughts here. And if you have questions, you can go ahead and type them into the chat. Um, I cannot see the chat when I am presenting. So Josh will filter those questions 
or you can just unmute yourself to ask questions. Or share thoughts. <laughs> Any questions, thoughts, concerns, or compliments I like to say to my students? I'll stop sharing really momentarily. I see that Josh has already answered some questions. All right, well, it looks like I might give you 15 minutes back. We do have a quick survey. Um, I'm gonna go ahead um, and share that screen. Josh also, posted the link in the chat. It's just a quick anonymous Google form survey to tell us what you thought about the presentation. If you want more information on active class or want to talk about pedagogy with me, I'm always excited to talk to educators about pedagogy. Um, my email is on the screen. You can also fill out the form and put your email in there and I can shoot you an email. Um, on behalf of Active Class, on behalf of Josh and I, I would just like to thank you so much for attending our webinar and hope you all have a great rest of the conference. And we'll stick around till the end of this period if, in case anyone decides to ask any follow-up questions. Yeah, absolutely. If um, if you think of something, we'll, we'll be here and we can answer questions for you. Or if you have any thoughts or ideas on how to implement this in your course, um, we absolutely can chat about that as well. Absolutely. Uh, and I'll just jump in here quick. Thank you again, Rachel uh, and Josh, for uh, participating. And thank you for everyone uh, who was able to attend. I hope to see you uh, later today. We've got one more session today, and then we've got four sessions uh, tomorrow. So thank you all. And I will stop the recording now.